this isn't the first thing you're probably going to talk about. I always encourage people start with the gospel. There are people that they're ready. They hear the gospel, boom, they're ready. And I've, I've talked to evolutionists that know that they're a sinner and they know they need a savior. And guess what? They come to Christ without even dealing with this issue. Um, but there are others that are going to say, hey, I got this question. There are those people you talked about. If evolution is true, doesn't that disprove God? And for those people, you ought to be ready to have that conversation. This book will help you do that. So Dr. Roberts talks about philosophy, and she talks about materialism, and not materialism as in a desire for monetary gain, but materialism as in the philosophical view that all that exists is the material universe. Kind of like Carl Sagan said, the universe is all that is or was or ever will be. That materialistic view. Is that philosophy or science, that kind of view? Uh, it's, it's ultimately, it's philosophy. And, you know, one name for it is materialism. Sometimes you could say it's atheism or, you know, uh, philosophical naturalism is, is another term for it. And so th those are philosophical commitments. And, and the, the bottom line is there's nothing in science that necessarily demands, you know, philosophical naturalism or materialism. Uh, so science doesn't lead us to those philosophical positions, but rather those, those philosophical positions are views that people have adopted for, for other reasons, not, not necessarily scientific reasons. Uh, but philosophical naturalism and, or materialism can influence how we go about doing science. Uh, it, it, the, t t today, when people engage in science, the, the philosophical framework they use is something called methodological naturalism. Mm -hmm. and, and methodological naturalism is not the same as philosophical naturalism, but they, they, they bump together in some very interesting ways. Methodological naturalism is, claims to be uh, agnostic on whether or not God exists. It just simply is a, a, a methodology that scientists agree ahead of time to use when they investigate nature, where they argue that we're not going to appeal to supernatural explanations, we're not going to appeal to the work of agency, but rather we're going to look for mechanistic explanations for the universe and phenomena in the universe. And, and many times that approach is all well and good, uh, but when it comes to questions dealing with origins, this is where I think methodological naturalism uh, can, can wind up creating mm -hmm. problems because the net effect of methodological naturalism is a priori you have excluded, again, agency and the supernatural as a possible explanation for the universe and, again, phenomena in the universe like, like living systems. And, uh, and so you have, if, if you are embracing methodological naturalism, that means that at the end of the day, the only legitimate explanation for, again, life's origin, design, and history would be evolutionary explanations, because these are, broadly speaking, the only ones that are mechanistic in nature. And so even if all the evidence stacks against some kind of evolutionary explanation, and that there's mounting evidence that points to agency being necessary, scientifically, you cannot go down that path. You are restricted from entertaining those possibilities, not because of the, the nature of the evidence, but because of the philosophical restrictions you've placed on how science can go about. And so what you've done then is you've, you've, rendered, method, uh, you've rendered science essentially an, an atheistic enterprise, inherently speaking, because of the influence of methodological naturalism. Sometimes people call it provisional atheism or benchtop atheism, uh, indicating that you are practically functioning like an atheist when you do science, regardless of whether you believe that God exists or not. And this, this then has a profound influence, I believe, in, in terms of, uh, of, of how people see, again, the case for or against evolution. The practice of going into a lab and using natural explanations to explain natural phenomena isn't a problem for Christians or scientists. We could take that too far, like you said, but of course, that's fine. And we live in a universe with laws that govern it because we have a law giver and it makes all the sense in the world that we could predict things based on those laws. And that is consistent with a Christian worldview, right? 
But what we can't do is assume that there are nothing but natural explanations and natural phenomena. That's that philosophical leap to say, hey, we're going to explain things with a natural explanation. That's fine. But to say there is only a natural explanation, that's that metaphysical leap that is very dangerous. Uh, I don't know who said it. You might remember, but somebody said evolution is the only game in town, so to say. People don't come to evolution because the evidence is compelling for it, but there's a philosophical decision. If, if I'm pre-committed to materialism, then evolution is all I got. Is that right? That, that's exactly right. And, and, we, I, and I want to be careful that we don't disparage the power of methodological naturalism because it's been a exactly. very successful framework for science. And, and, and what may be helpful here for people that hold to a Christian worldview is to distinguish between primary causation and secondary causation. And so methodological naturalism is the right approach to take when we're looking at trying to understand secondary causation, right? So, so as you say, and, and I agree, that, that, that the creator that brought the universe into existence has organized the universe in such a way that it conforms to laws of nature. And, and, and that the fact that it conforms to the laws of nature means that science is even possible, that we can discover those laws and we can make predictions about what the future is going to be like because of our understanding of the, of, of, and the predictability and the intelligibility of the universe. And, and so it's fine for us to, under, to study how those laws of nature work. What, what are the cause and effect relationships? Uh, that's understanding and studying secondary causation, where, of course, we want to limit ourselves now to mechanistic explanations by, by the nature of what we're studying. But th that methodological naturalism is not going to be effective at telling us where those laws came from to begin with. That's a question of primary causation. And so when you're getting into questions dealing with origins, let's say the, the origin of life or or the history of, of life on earth. These are places where you could potentially say mechanism could explain some aspects of origins, but also this is a place where you would expect there to be also instances of primary causation. So what methodological naturalism does is forces all of the explanations to, to be only those that are mechanistic in nature and doesn't allow for exploration of primary causation. And, and the fact of the matter is science has the toolkit to explore the, the, the agency as an explanation. SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, is predicated on the ability of astronomers to distinguish between electromagnetic radiation emanating from a natural object versus an, an alien civilization. They can detect agency and, and signatures for the work of agency in electromagnetic radiation or an archaeologist can pick up a rock and tell you, was that rock shaped by natural processes or by a hominin, by an intelligent agent of sorts? And so science does have the toolkit to detect agency, but it's prevented from, from exercising that toolkit when it comes to questions of dealing with the origin of life or the origin in, in the design of, of biochemical systems, uh, for example.